Today's class is going to be on how strategies can be implemented. And by the end of the lecture, we anticipate to tackle a number of thematic areas, ranging from the nature of strategy and also appreciating why annual objectives are very much relevant when it comes to the implementation of strategy. And we will zero in and finally, finally finish on the seven imperatives of strategic HR, which are relevant for the implementation of any given strategy. So the nature of strategy. The, the nature of strategy implementation. In, in other words, strategy implementation can be explained as any process that involves putting the plans that have been formulated, so the strategic plans or the strategic choices that have been already formulated into action in order to achieve the desired goals of an organization. So anytime an attempt is made to put into practice all the beautiful ideas that were brought up during the formulation of a strategy in order to test whether it will help us achieve the long-term aspirations of an organization, then we are dealing with strategy implementation. Generally speaking, strategy implementation involves the degree to which one is able to align organizational resources, be it human, non-human, time, and energy, as well as processes and activities with the strategic objectives attainments. Um, in terms of strategy Im implementation, it is different from strategy formulation from several angles. And that is what we have on our screen. We are going to appreciate how strategy formulation can be differentiated from strategy implementation in order to appreciate how the transitioning from one of the, these stages to the other and go through. So the first point along which strategy formulation can be differentiated from strategy implementation borders on uh, the positioning of forces before action. So with respect to strategy formulation, it involves preparing and planning before any action can be taken. And this positioning before action also indicates that the strategy formulation activity is more about setting the stage for what needs to be done in terms of identifying possible opportunities and also positioning an organization to take an advantage of these um, opportunities that may exist out there. But with respect to strategy implementation, it involves managing and directing resources and efforts so that the strategy that is put into action can achieve the desired resource the organization has part to achieve. So strategy implementation on that score is more about ensuring that the plan strategies are executed properly. I, I, I can, can. With respect to the second angle where strategy formulation can be differentiated from, differentiated from strategy implementation, also borders on the focus, whether it is being focused on efficiency or effectiveness. So whereas strategy formulation primarily strives to create a plan that will effectively achieve the desired outcomes of an organization, strategy implementation rather focuses on rolling out uh, plans that can ensure that there is efficiency 
in the utilization of organizational resources. So these resources must be used optimally to ensure that there is minimal wastages, breakages, and if you like, delays in the operational processes. On another score, strategy formulation can also be characterized as primarily an intellectual process. So when we say we are formulating a strategy, most of the things that it borders on has to do with brainstorming, um, planning, thinking, and analyzing. Sometimes most of these things end up being placed on a sheet of paper or a series of papers. And this requires deep understanding of the business environment, the competitors, the internal capabilities of an organization. But those activities that fall within these formulation activities tend to be an intellectual process or it may even end up on a sheet of paper. Conversely, strategy implementation primarily is an operational process, which means a lot of action and doing is manifested. So strategy implementation is about the operationalization of the strategic plans. And this may involve day-to-day, week-to-week management and the practical aspect of executing the strategy. And the last facet on which strategy formulation can be differentiated from strategy implementation includes the requirement for good intuition and analytical skills. So usually when we are formulating strategy uh, or effective strategy formulation may require the ability to analyze volumes of data and trends. And so if you can remember during some of the tools that we were using to scan the business environments, we made reference to a lot of these analytical tools, okay? And following the analysis, it is also right for one to be able to make insightful decisions based on experiences and intuition. And that is more relevant for strategy formulation. On the contrary, when it comes to strategy implementation, it requires special motivation and leadership skills in order for it to thrive. So successful strategy implementation are said to require strong leadership to motivate and guide the rest of the organizational team to follow suit. Leaders need to inspire and drive their teams to achieve their strategic goals. And so they must motivate others by De demonstrating an exemplary model for others to also follow through. And that means that if you do not have the right leaders in place, you may have the most viable strategy formulated, but its implementation stage will suffer a lot of challenges along the way. So these are the four avenues along which strategy formulation can be differentiated from strategy implementation. In order to implement, in order to achieve an organization's long-term objectives, it is appropriate to break them to achievable and manageable ones. So that brings us to the issue of annual objectives. Annual objectives can be characterized as the desired milestones that a given organization need to achieve in order to ensure successful strategy implementation. So on what basis can we say that a strategy that was formulated to help us strive towards the attainment of the long-term objectives of an organization has been successfully implemented. It can only be done when these long-term objectives are broken down to annual ones, and these annual ones will then serve as a guideline directing 
organizational efforts and resources. So when we talk about annual objectives, that is what essentially we mean to communicate. Annual objectives can be designed as very much essential for the translation of an organization's strategic plans into actionable and achievable targets. If you want to achieve the long-term objectives, or the ultimate ends of an organization, which may be striving into five years or 10 years to come, it is appropriate that you compartmentalize them into reasonable ones that can be approached within the shortest time frame. And so that is where the annual objectives come in. The relevance or um, main things that annual objectives strive to achieve as far as guiding an organization to align with long-term aspirations is concerned are actually five. So five main benefits can be derived as far as annual objectives are concerned. And the first one is that annual objectives represent the basis for allocating resources in terms of the time, money, personnel, and what have you. So by drawing annual objectives from the long-term objectives of an organization, it can also facilitate management to make available resources and uh, apportion it across the various facets of the organization. The second one also borders on the fact that annual objectives serves as a primary mechanism for evaluating managers. So if we want to discern whether managers are, are on the right route to the attainment of an organization's long-term aspirations, it is these annual objectives that have been set for them that can be used as the standard to appraise their managerial performance. And so if their, their, their actual performance is deviating from the annual objectives that has been set for them, then we can look out for remedies to mitigate the situation. So that is the second point. And the third relevance is that annual objectives are major instruments for monitoring the progress towards the long-term objectives. So as I indicated in my introductory remarks, as far as annual objectives are concerned, they are fragments of the long-term aspirations. And when you break these long-term objectives into its components, which are supposed to be achieved in terms, an organization can discern whether it is on the right path towards its annual of the, the attainment of its annual objectives or otherwise when they are able to utilize these annual objectives as a marker for their progress towards the attainment of the long-term objectives then the fourth benefit is that it helps in establishing organizational divisional and departmental priorities so every single organization as we are all aware, has a number of departments or units that are all striving towards the attainment of the organization's ultimate goals. And each of these departments are expected to have their own specific objectives, which must mutually support the remaining varied uh, departments' objectives towards the attainment of the ultimate objectives. And in doing so, they, these annual objectives, when they are properly set and clearly communicated, can help the organization to identify areas of their product lines or divisions or departments that they must prioritize. This is important because depending on the strategy that is being pursued by an organization, certain departments are supposed to play cardinal role or uh, be, be forebearers for the success or failure of that particular venture. And so once we are able to have these annual objectives and identify the departments that are going to play a central role in it, then we will also be able to prioritize them in terms of making available, uh, making available to them all the resources that they will require to flourish.
Then the last one is that annual objectives are essential for keeping strategic plans on track. Without annual objectives, it will be very much difficult to verify whether an organization is on track as far as it runs towards the attainment of the long-term aspirations is concerned. Now, generally speaking, annual objectives can be expressed severally. So there are several metrics that are available to project the annual objective that a particular organization and its varied departments or divisions may be striving to achieve. Now, these metrics include profitability. So the annual objective of a given organization may be coined to reflect their intention to achieve a particular profitability marker. Then it could also center around growth potential. And this may also be expressed in some level of percentages. It may also be expressed in terms of the market share that the organization intends to achieve, whether 50% of the market share, 80% or what have you. It may also project the organization intention to have a lot of visibility in a given geographical area across a particular customer group or in terms of introducing additional products onto their uh, operations. So on the screen are some of these varied metrics along which annual objectives may be point. So if you look at the Statement Company in its hierarchy, and you also peruse the various divisions and departments that they are having, you realize, for instance, for the Division 1, the annual objective is to increase divisional revenue by 40%. Now, if we go to uh, Division 3, the annual objective of that particular division is to increase divisional revenue by 50%, which means that even though the same organization may be trying to achieve a particular long-term objective, which is to double company revenue in two years through market development and market penetration, the specific divisional objectives that are being pursued on annual basis also vary. The same can be said about the functional areas of Statmos, uh, Stamos company. So if you look at the research and development annual objective, it is striving to develop two new products in the year successfully. But if we also peruse their finance annual objective, it is to strive to obtain long-term financial, like long-term financing of $400,000 in the next six months. So this is how the varied metrics of annual objectives can be derived for the various divisions, business units, and departments that may be found in an organization in an attempt to help the organization achieve its long-term objectives. Another thing that we are going to treat is policies. In order to implement an already formulated strategy successfully, it is imperative to have policies to guide the direction and the procedures that will, that will surround the implementation activities. So it is also important to know that before you can institutionalize any form of change in a firm, the strategic direction that will bring about these changes, particularly when it comes to implementation of strategies, they do not occur automatically. And it is these policies that are going to guide the day-to-day -day operations and activities of the 
um, organization. As far as the implementation of the strategy is concerned, so in order to make strategies work, there is the need to formulate policies to guide the day-to-day -day operations and procedures of the organization. So what then are policies? Policies are essentially specific guidelines. It could also be methods or procedures. It could be rules of engagement or administrative practices that are usually forged to support and also encourage day-to-day -day operations that are geared towards the attainment of a stated goal. Now, policies are said to be instruments because they facilitate strategy implementation in three main angles. So three main reasons exist for why it is important for strategy implementation to be accompanied by the required policies. And these include the fact that policies set the boundaries Con, uh, the boundaries, constraints, and limits on the kind of administrative actions that can be taken to reward and sanction behavior. So, essentially, we can say policies provide the permissive zone of variation within which employees will be rewarded for exemplary and um, demonstrating a desired behavior plus also warding off or admonishing individuals that will demonstrate deviant behavior that does not utter well for organizational success. So that is what we mean as far as the first bullet is concerned. Now, the second one is that policies also let both employees and managers know what is expected of them, thereby increasing the likelihood that strategies will be implemented successfully. So by demarcating the permissive zone of variation, both employees and their managers will know their, their responsibilities and be guided accordingly to work within those policy guidelines. They also provide the basis for management control and allow coordination across organizational units. And what this means is that once we are able to put down policies to guide the implementation of, sorry, the, the, yeah, the implementation of strategies. It is able to provide the avenue for management to bring some level of compliance through control. So if individuals are going outside the policies, management can code some of these policy specifications to bring them back on track. And that will also assist individuals to work within the facets that have been that have been carved out within the organizational structure and also ensure compliance across various units. Policies are also said to reduce the amount of time that managers may spend making decisions. And so policies in this regard will help in clarifying what work is to be done, by who, how it is to be done, and why it is to be done the, the way it is expected to be done. And this will bring some level of clarity as far as decision by managers on some of these directives are concerned. And the fifth one is that policies are said to promote delegation of decision-making to appropriate managerial levels where various problems usually arises. So if there isn't much clarity as to who can assist managers in performing certain duties or responsibilities, the policy guideline will speculate who may have the next, who may be the next in key in terms of the hierarchy of authority. For such, besides hierarchy of authority, we can also think about if from the angle where we are looking at the succession plan that has been specified through policy and also through the organizational structure that has been 
calves as a result of the policy. And so when it becomes right for managers to reduce the volume of responsibility on their desk, they can rely on those guidelines in order to do appropriate delegation without without confronting any challenges that may um, crop up, particularly if the individuals that are going to assume the responsibility does not have the clearance or the, the capacity, or if you like, the authority to will that particular responsibility. And the last one is that policies help to clarify what can and what cannot be done in the pursuit of an organizational objectives, which simply suggests that by having policies formulated and made available to every facet of an organization, it can serve as the compass that can regulate what is done and what is not done in the organization. And if it is pursued to the latter, that will encourage the demonstration of suitable uh, ethical and uh, suitable work practices whilst warding of counterproductive work behaviors. Now, in order to adequately and sufficiently implement strategies that have been formulated for the pursuit of long-term organizational objectives, it is also important for the required resources to be harnessed Four main types of resources are usually harnessed or leveraged in an attempt to implement strategies. And these include financial resources, physical resources, human resources, and technological resources. So the financial resources are essentially the, the monetary aspects that are usually budgeted prior to the implementation. And some of these resources will need to facilitate the operational processes in terms of acquiring the right materials and incentivizing the key players to do the right thing. Then there are the physical resources, which may border on the, uh, the it may border on issues such as the machines, the tools, the various offices and their spaces, buildings, and what have you. That can also be utilized as an avenue to implement the strategy successfully. Then the human component, which is individuals that possess what it takes to assist in the attainment of the said strategies. And for this particular part, it is important to have individuals whose knowledge, skills, and abilities fit the task that is expected to be um, executed, particularly during the implementation stage. Then technological resources, which also borders on the innovation or the technological architecture, which can enhance the expeditious efficient and effective operational processes of the implementation activities. Now, it is also important to allocate resources appropriately, because if we do not allocate resources in the right quantities and at the right time, at the right place, in a cost-effective manner, the implementation stage of a strategy will suffer a lot of hiccups. So resource allocation uh, can be explained as the distribution of an organizational assets across the varied business units, um, departments, divisions, or if you like, regions, with respect to the priorities that have been established according to the annual objectives. 
So as we explained earlier on, as far as all objectives is concerned, one of the key benefits is that it facilitates the allocation of resources. So when the time becomes ripe for resources to be allocated, because certain areas have been identified as priority, priority areas, which can help the organization excel in its pursuit of annual objectives, it becomes necessary that we also target those priority areas and churn out resources to them. And that is not to say the other aspects of the organization will be stifled with respect to the provision of resources. In as much as equal attention will be paid to them, much of the priority will be given to those vital strategic implementation activities. Now, beyond resource allocation, it is also important to be concerned about conflict management during strategy implementation. This is so because resources, as we are all aware, will never be abundant. And so when there are constraints on the use of scarce resources, definitely they are likely for conflicts to, uh, uh, to crop up or even escalate. And when, when it is not adequately managed during the strategy implementation stage, it may truncate our intention of pursuing the attainment of a long-term objective. So what then constitutes conflict? Conflict can be simply the same as any form of disagreement between two or more parties on one or more issues. And so the parties here may be uh, parties within a particular department, and that can be construed as inter, uh, interpersonal conflicts. Now, we can also have conflicts occurring between two or more group factions that may be found within a department or within an organization. And at that level, we may be calling it intergroup conflicts. Intergroup conflict may also be characterized as interdepartmental conflict when the, the disagreement is between two or more departments. So anytime we discuss disagreement between individuals or parties within an organization, then we are dealing with intra-organizational conflict. But sometimes too, conflict can escalate to ensue between two or more organizations. Whenever there is, an, there is a disagreement uh, on one or more issues. So at that level, then we call it inter-organizational conflict. But for the benefit of implementing a strategy, it should be made known that differences in opinion, um, sometimes one department may be striving to protect and have sole access to the use of a particular resource, such as maybe a printer or um, an office space for their own actions. So whenever some of these things are scarce and they, there is a likelihood that there is, a, there is going to be a disagreement as far as the use of some of these resources or um, utilities are concerned, then it becomes necessary for us to be careful about how to manage conflict during the implementation of a strategy. Research suggests that there are several avenues that you can utilize to resolve conflict, but for the purpose of implementing a strategy, we can make reference to three main typologies of conflict management styles including the avoidance style, the diffusion style, and the confrontational style. So with respect to the avoidance style, you can liken it to a situation where you are fleeing the situation. And as we've been made aware, if you fail to, if you run away from a battle today, you will stand a chance of fighting it in the foreseeable future. So when we say you are utilizing the avoidance strategy to resolve conflict during the implementation of a strategy, it simply involves 
actions that are either to ignore the conflicts or to remove the conflicting parties from each other, uh, from each other's presence, with the view of allowing the conflict to diminish by itself. So typical strategies that can be utilized when we adopt the avoidance means to resolving conflicts during strategy implementation may include ignoring the problem altogether. So what this means is that you can uh, let the parties pretend that the conflict does not exist in the first place, or they, they, you, you allow them not to acknowledge the presence of the conflict, which may be quite difficult to do in reality, because um, even though some specific ind individuals can turn their mind off the existing conflict, and for that matter, focus on the most important activities that requires their attention, in practice, Sometimes the presence of the other party will ignite or trigger the conflicting issue to, to come to the fore. Another strategy, as far as our avoidance option is concerned, also involves physical separation, wherein you will keep the conflicting individuals apart. So that will mean that you will have to remove uh, all of them from the environment where there is the likelihood for the conflict to escalate. The second conflict manage management style, as far as strategy implementation is concerned, can be likened to diffusion. And diffusion here refers to the degree to which actions that reduce the intensity or brevity of the conflict is introduced. And this is to find temporary or partial solutions that will allow the parties to coexist without necessarily resolving the conflict fundamentally. Now, specific actions that can be utilized as far as the diffusion strategy is concerned include playing down the differences. So, one of the possibilities why two or more parties may experience conflicts during the implementation stage is that they may have differing opinion towards how the implementation may affect their interests or their concerns. And so by emphasizing on common interests, you will end up by playing the differences that they may have as far as their interest is concerned. And this can help to diffuse or reduce the tensions that they are having as far as the scarce resources or their interest is concerned. In, this, um, the, in the second vein, diffusion can also be achieved when you are able to allow each of the parties come to a, a compromising point. So by finding a middle ground where neither party feels that they've been cheated or they are the winner and the others are the losers, you are able to diffuse the tensions between the parties. Another avenue that can be utilized to achieve the diffusion strategy as far as conflict management during the strategy implementation stage is concerned is utilizing majority rule. So by using a de democratic process to make decisions whenever there are disagreements, at least it can help to diffuse the tension for the interim with the view that in future, those that will not win now may also have the chances of winning. Then the next option that is available to conflict management is the confrontational uh, strategy. And when we say 
you are utilizing the confrontation option to remedy conflicts during strategy implementation. It involves directly addressing the conflicts and working through the differences or the varied interests of the parties to find an amicable resolution. And specific strategies that can be employed during the confrontation option is um, exchanging members. So you will be you will have to exchange members across the parties. And this involves having members of the conflicting parties switch rules or positions. And once you're able to help them switch positions and go and operate under the different groups, they are able to understand things and uh, the perspective of that particular group. And when they come back, they will now be able to appreciate the views and the perspective that is being put across by their conflicting parties. And they will be inclined to make concessions or come to a resolution. In addition, the confrontation strategy can also employ uh, meetings. And during these meetings, you will bring the conflicting parties together to allow them to present their views and hear the different views of their conflicting parties. And when this opportunity is provided for them to dialogue, there is the room for them to understand their varied viewpoints and end up collaborating to work through their differences. In a nutshell, conflict management is very much vital to the attainment of a viable strategy implementation in the sense that resources may be scarce, parties that may be striving to implement a given strategy may also have their own interests and positions. And so it is imperative to utilize one or two of the, these conflict management styles in order to bring a resolution that will not truncate the implementation of a given strategy. And these options include avoidance, diffusion, and confrontation. It is also important to be cautious during the implementation of any forged strategy. Because strategies do not flourish in a vacuum, but they are uh, the implementation must also follow the structure that has been made by the organization. For that reason, we can conclude that it is appropriate for one to be concerned about matching the structure of a given organization with the strategy that it is also striving to implement. Generically speaking, organizational structure can be explicated as any formal arrangement of jobs within a given organization. And when these formal structures are arranged visually, then we generate what we call organizational charts. It is also important to note that changes in strategy will often require changes in an organizational structure for two main reasons. And the first reason is that structure of an organization largely dictates how objectives and policies will be established. So the first reason why we are saying it is important to match structure of an organization with a strategy is that structure of an organization largely dictates how the objectives and the policies uh, of the organization will also be established. For that reason, the, uh, when we are able to align the structure with the strategy, we are also able to 
align the strategy with the strategic, sorry, we are able to align the organizational structure with the strategic goals of the organization. And to paraphrase, what I'm trying to say is that whenever a given organization changes its strategy, its objectives and policies must also be recalibrated with the new direction that the organization wants to pursue. For that reason, the structure of the organization plays a crucial role in ensuring that there is an alignment with the uh, long-term objectives. The second major reason why we are saying there should be an alignment between organizational structure and the strategy is that um, the structure dictates how resources are supposed to be allocated. So when we say the structure dictates how resources will be allocated, we are essentially interested in one, their priority areas, and two, how resources can be efficiently distributed. So with respect to the efficient distribution of resources, an effective organizational structure will ensure that the resources of the organization, including the financial, the human, technological, time, and all that may be available, are allocated efficiently to support the strategic objectives. So whenever there are changes in the strategy, it often means that we have to reallocate the resources. So that is where the realignment must come in to the new areas of focus, which might require different structural setup. Now, it is also imperative to note that strategy dictates how resources will be allocated in the sense that it helps us in prioritizing strategic, strategic initiatives. So the structure of the organization will help us to know the prioritize strategic initiatives by clearly defining which departments, which units, or which divisions are responsible for what. And once these are clearly typified in the organizational charts, we can thereafter allocate resources to these prioritized areas. Now, um, stru structure is said to also dictate how resources should be allocated in the sense that it can lead to the attainment of flexibility and adaptability as far as the organizational operations is concerned. So a flexible structure will ordinarily allow an organization to, to be agile by adapting quickly to the strategic changes that may maintain in their operations. And this may involve the creation of cross-functional teams, um, introducing metrics structures or metrics managerial avenues, or introducing divisional structures in order to cater for the varied portfolios or product lines that is being pursued by a given organization. Okay. Now, what then are the symptoms of an ineffective organizational structure? So we have quite a while learned that it is important for the structure of an organization to be aligned with the strategy that is being going to be implemented. So that if the strategy requires some amount of changes or uh, modifications for it to be more fitting for the strategy being pursued, then you do it in that regard. But there are certain symptoms that demonstrate that a given organizational structure is ineffective and may not utter well for the implementation of a given strategy. So what are some of these symptoms? The first symptom is that there may be too many levels of management. 
Now, if you have several levels of several levels or layers of management, what that means is that things that could have been quickly discussed and uh, quickly led to a decision making will require all these levels of management to be exhausted before a finality can be achieved. And this is typical of the bureaucratic organizational structures that model after the Weberian organizational mechanism. So by Weberian, I'm referring to Max Weber's classical theory of structuring organizations. Then whenever there are too many meetings attended by too many people, then we can say that the way that the organization has been structured is not more effective. So when you have, oh, think about it this way, when you have so many individuals attending a meeting, decision-making will be time-consuming and you will have to hear the opinion or perspective of anyone that may, wants to make a contribution or wants to propose an idea during the uh, the meeting proceedings. And in, in order to um, arrive at decision during such forums, it will be too laborious to achieve. The third symptom of an ineffective organizational structure is when you have too many, too much attention being directed towards solving interdepartmental conflicts. So whenever there are uh, recurring interdepartmental conflicts, it suggests that the way the organization has been structured is not allowing the very departments to collaborate. Rather, they become more competitive and confrontational, which requires an attention to be paid in order to redesign the organization to make the functioning of the very departments to be mutually supported. Now, when there is too much span of control, that is also a characterization that the organizational structure is ineffective. So span of control, which is also known as span of management, simply refers to the number of employees that are expected to report to a particular superior at a point in time. So as I indicated, span of control can also be explained as span of management. And the traditional view of organizational design recommends that the span of control of any given superior or manager should be between, in fact, it should be about seven subordinates. So they are saying that the total number of subordinates that are supposed to be managed by a superior or a manager should be seven. However, many lean organizations, so when I say lean, it means that they have a flat structure. Many lean organizations today have span of management that are as high as 30 or 40 or even higher. And you can visualize and preempt the sort of challenges that we will experience whenever we have one superior superintending over 40 or higher number of workforce. But certain circumstances or uh, conditions may be good for large fund of control. So even though the Traditional view suggests that span of control, uh, whenever a, a manager is having more than seven subordinates supervising, is dysfunctional. There are certain conditions that may call for large span of control. And these include um, a situation where the work is performed by the work performed by the subordinates is in a stable and routine fashion. So you can liken that to those that work at the assembly line or the really, really, those that perform relay activities, wherein 
the input of one individual becomes the output of another person. And so the activities and the functions that are being performed there is more routine or repetitive. If that is the case, then even when you, you do not have a supervisor around, and but you have individuals that are capable of indulging in their repetitive activity, then they can thrive without, uh, they can thrive under such high span of control or large span of control. Again, when subordinates perform similar tasks, then you can also have large span of control uh, working for the organization. Moreover, when subordinates are also concentrated at a single location, then they can be managed by a single supervisor or superior. So those are some of the conditions under which large span of control will thrive, even though, generally speaking, large span of con control is a symptom of an ineffective organizational structure. So my admonishment here is that don't just be going around people's offices and be, be commenting that because they have more than, the superior has more than seven people superintending over, then the organizational structure is dysfunctional. You will have to just oppose that situation with some of these cont contingents I enumerated. Another indication of an ineffective organizational structure is when there are too many unachieved objectives. So another one is when there is declining corporate or business performance. When you realize that the present structure is not in a position to help the organization achieve their set objective, particularly at the corporate or the business level, then we can say perhaps the structure is ineffective. In the same vein, another symptom of an ineffective organizational structure borders on losing grounds to rivals. So when in a competitive environment, the rivals are always having an edge over you, then it's suffice to say that the strategy that you are pursuing is not attuned with the structure that you also have in place. And so you need to check your structure and the strategy again. And finally, when revenue or earnings divided by number of employees or uh, number of managers is very low compared to the rivals, then you should know that you are having, you are running an ineffective structure, which may suggest that perhaps you are making revenue all right, but you have a lot of redundant people or redundant units not being fully utilized in the organization as far as their potentials is concerned. So you may have to go through what we call uh, re-engineering or restructuring. Uh, Stephanie, kindly mute your microphone. Stephanie, mute your microphone. Now, so as I indicated earlier on, it is appropriate for a match of an organizational structure to be uh, made to the strategy that is being pursued, particularly when it comes to implementation. And if you want to do your, your groundwork well to achieve a viable strategy implementation outcome, then it is important to appreciate the sort of structure that you have in place. So we are going to look at the four main typologies of organizational structure that are available for firms to utilize in implementing their strategy. In fact, this particular, uh, the, these ones that we are going to consider, we treated them in level 200. So under normal circumstances, I shouldn't have treated them again. But I know my students, most of you will say, either they were not in my organizational behavior class or they have never seen it before. So if you still have my organizational behavior slice, 
when you go and check my lectures on organizational structure and design, you'll find the same contents in there. So generally, there are four main types of organizational structure. Four main types of organizational structure. And these include the functional structure, the divisional structure, the matrix structure, and the uh, strategic business units structure. So the functional structure. Research suggests that the functional structure, which is also characterized as the vertical functional structure, is the most widely used organizational structure because it's, it is easy to design and it is also easy, easy to be understood by whoever will be visualizing the charts that will be derived from the vertical functional structure. And in terms of uh, the financial burden on an organization, as far as filling it with right human resources and other logistics for the organization to operate, it tends to be also less expensive to run. So I'm saying that visually it is easy to understand and make meaning out of the functional structure. And it is also less expensive compared to the other alternative structures that are available. So when we say functional structure, it simply means that an attempt is made to break down the entire task, duties, or responsibilities that are expected to be accomplished by the said organization according to the varied units, departments, or if you like, sections of the organization. So some of these specific business units or departments may range from the Department of Production or Operations through the Department of Marketing, Accounting and Finance, Research and Development, uh, Management Information System, and what have you. And this is, those of you that have a photographic memory, you, will rem you should be able to recall that you have seen this particular slide before. So this is a visual representation of a typical vertical functional structure that can be subscribed to when it comes to the implementation of a given strategy. So on what we have on our screen, you realize that at the apex is the president of the organization, which is the most important or um, the, the most powerful position as far as this organogram is concerned. But beneath the president are specific functional areas that have been created to help this bottling water, water bottling company to produce and distribute their mineral water to their intended customers. So beneath the president is a department for accounting, which is headed by the vice, which is headed by um, a vice president. So the accounting director over there will be a vice president. Then another department that is also relevant for this water bottling company is the HR department, which is headed by the HR director. Then another department is the production department, which is headed by uh, the production director, characterized as a, another vice president. Then another director handling the marketing activities of the firm. Now, if we go beneath the accounting department, we will also verify that there are other specific areas of specialization, including the information center, the financial analyst, and the chief accountant. Now, the chief accountant is also the supervisor of the accounts payable and the, pay, uh, the payroll clerk. If we come to the HR departments, the HR director is also superintending over the personnel that is 
playing the role of benefit administrator as well as the industrial relations manager. So under this organogram, within the HR department, there are three main functional responsibilities. Then when it comes to the production of the mineral water, the production director is also superintending over the maintenance supervisor, the quality control manager, and the bottling plant superintendent. And the bottling plant superintendent is also supervising the activities of the bottling supervisor. And so beneath the bottling supervisor will also be the individual that will be filling the bottles, um, putting them into their right boxes, and sealing them and what have you. So typical example of a functional structure will be what we have on our screen. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the vertical functional structure? As I indicated, it is very much simple to understand and less uh, expensive to run. It also capitalizes on specialization of business activities so that you are able to have a division of labor clearly marked out in the organization. And it also minimizes the need for elaborate control system because each department will have its own supervisor controlling activities therein. And it also allows for strict decision making because each department will have its own supervisor or manager that will be responsible for guiding and arriving decisions over there. Compared to the matrix or the divisional structure, wherein all these divisions will have to uh, take their arrive at decisions at their various constituencies before it is escalated to the centralized points for the decision to be consolidated. And some of the disadvantages is that accountability tend to be forced to the top. Accountability tend to be forced to the top. So although the, the respective directors or managers of the functional areas, such as the HR director, the accounting director, may not may, may be giving direction and coordinating activities of their various departments when responsibilities are not properly attained or things go wrong. They are the ones that are held accountable because the back stops with them. So for that reason, we are not able to hold um we are not we are able to hold the the managers accountable for things that may go wrong and they also they also take credit for excellence at their various departments. Then delegation of authority and responsibility is also not encouraged simply because if you liken it to the classical uh, Max Weber's bureaucratic school of thought, what that means is that managers or supervisors tend to feel that they are losing their power whenever they delegate responsibility. So the functional structure does not encourage delegation. And it also minimizes career development because it does not provide room for individuals to like that's maybe aspiring to pursue a career trajectory outside their current department to do so. You are confined within the rigid structure to progress. And it may also, because of that reason, it may end up lowering employee and managerial morale, particularly when they are, they are forced to work according to the chain of command, but the chain of command is not giving them the desired results. Inadequate planning for products and markets. So sometimes it may lead to inadequate preparation or planning for products and markets to be uh, introduced. And this is so because the, the organization tend to rely more on their on their depart, respective departments' efficiencies. And so when they are not able to come together as a, a unified front to 
plan about a given product that is going to be introduced, especially when we are formulating the product development team and it does not compose varied individuals across the various functional areas, then you will realize that the planning team may come out with a poor plan that may not utter well for their products and their markets. And it may also lead to short-term or narrow thinking. And finally, we say it leads to communication problems, particularly because there are several hurdles or several uh, hierarchies to go through if you, if you want to communicate something, something simple to the CEO or the president of the company. The, the bureaucracy nature of the vertical functional structure will require that you will channel it through your supervisor. And your supervisor will also channel it to the next in line of authority. And that will slow down the pace with which communication is done. In the same vein, com communication is said to uh, be problematic as far as this structure is concerned because when information is being passed from top to down or from bottom to up, because it may end up going through several channels, by the time it gets to the desired audience, it is either going to be diluted or some salient portions will be taken out of it. So for that reason, we may say it leads to communication problems. The second option, as far as the struct organizational structures that are available to implement strategies, is the divisional structure. And the divisional structure is simply um, a type of structure that tends to operate with a decentralized, a decentralized focus. It is also characterized to be um, second to the second most sought after structure as after the vertical functional structure. And it is sometimes referred to as the um, business unit structure, profit center structure, or um, segmented structure of an organization. So what happens with the um, development and usage of divisional structure is that as small businesses or small organizations grow and maybe introduce different products or portfolios, it will become more difficult to use a simple functional structure to manage these different products or services that the, the said organization may be um, bringing into the business market. So it becomes necessary that um, the organization try to break down their operations and develop structures beneath each of the operations in order for them to achieve the intended objective of the very divisions or product lines. So on our screen is a comparison between a typical functional structure and a divisional structure. If we take a sober look at the functional structure, you realize that it is championed by the president. So the president occupies the most powerful position in the functional structure. But beneath the presidents are uh, specific functional areas, including research and development, finance, manufacturing, and marketing. And all the directors of these functional areas will be reporting to the president. Now, if we sharply compare this functional structure with the division structure, which is in point B and in the uh, below, picture we have on our screen, you will realize that beneath the president, the company has three main divisions. And the division one is championing the production of electronics. 
Division two is also championing uh, biotechnology, whilst Division three is championing consumable products. And beneath each di division are vertical functional structures ranging from research and development, manufacturing, accounting and finance, and marketing. So whenever we talk about a divisional structure, it simply means that you are developing a structure that will assist an organization that has several product lines or business units to have specific structures that will assist in the complement of, of the objectives of each of the divisions. So the primary difference, and please take note of this, because it is not on the slide. The primary difference between the functional structure and the divisional structure is that the chain of command from each of the functions converge lower at the hierarchy as far as the divisional structure is concerned. In the has a chain of command that we are essentially referring to the um, reporting lines or the hierarchy of authority. If we look at the functional structure, the chain of command is going towards the precedence. And beneath each of the functional areas, such as research and development, you will have each of the subordinates reporting to them. But under the matrix structure, sorry, the divisional structure, <clears throat> the, the chain of command of each function is converging lower to the hierarchy. It's in over division, division one, chain of command will converge for, for recent in development will converge beneath it. For manufacturing will also converge there. And for uh, kind of saying for finance, it will also converge beneath finance. Now the, the same can be said about division two. So the chain of command under the division two, when we take research in development, will converge beneath them. For finance will also converge beneath here. For marketing will also converge beneath here. Then the same can be said about division three. So the chain of command under division three, as far as manufacturing is con con concerned, will converge beneath here. For finance will come here, and therefore research and development will come here. Which means that when there is a problem to be resolved at the divisional level, it will be handled by the divisional heads. So, for instance, if there is a problem to be handled by, uh, there is a conflict to be resolved at Division 1, it won't, the Division 2 and 3 will not be bothered about it because they have no role to play over there. Division 1 is autonomous in itself. And that is why we see the divisional structure encourage uh, decentralization because the president will delegate resp um, responsibility and authority for these divisional heads to handle conflicts and confusions that will crop up over there. So typically, typically in a divisional structure, differences in opinion among, for instance, research and development departments, as well as the marketing department, manufacturing and the accounting and finance departments will be resolved at that divisional level. So if we are talking about some of these confusions at Division 1, it will be resolved there. Division 2 and 3 will not be interested in it. And that is why we say that the divisional structure encourages centralization. Unlike the functional structure, wherein even the president will have to come and intervene. And that is why we say that there is concentration of power at the upper echelon. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of utilizing the divisional structure? So the first advantage is that it encourages clear accountability. 
wherein uh, the president or the CEO of a corporation will not have to uh, come down to respond to some of these confusions, but rather the in individuals that are playing roles at the div various divisions will be held accountable for their fortunes or misfortunes. It also allows local control of local situations. And that is what I meant when I gave an example that conflict between uh, conflict within a division will be resolved by the divisional head, but it will not be of concern to the president or other divisional heads. And it also creates career development chances in the sense that individuals within the division are able to find their career trajectory and they can pursue it to the latter. It also promotes delegation of authority because there is um, what we call, it, it, because it allows centralization to be the center stage of decision processes. And for that matter, when leaders delegate their authority for subordinates to accomplish, they do not feel they are losing power. It also leads to competitive clim uh, climate internally in the sense that the same organization may be pursuing varied product lines. And when we utilize this divisional structure and apportion resources and um, resources for the pursuit of each division, you will realize that in the long run, it is this, the, the same organization that is going to benefit. And sometimes so when one of the divisions is not a, a struggling to compete, capital can be injected from other divisions that are viable onto those ones. It's, we can also say that it allows easy adding of new products or regions. And that is so because as much as possible, you can be introducing the divisional structure allows for more divisions to be introduced. And that will mean that whenever we want to uh, introduce or take away some products or business units, we can easily do so. Then they, there is also the notion that it allows strict control and attention to products, customers, and regions. And that is so because the division, the divisional structure allows for each division, so a product line to focus on what they can do best at the relegation of what other div divisions are concerned with. Now, the disadvantage is that it can be too costly to run. If you take a sober look at the structure we have over here, under each division, you will be having functional specializations ranging from research and development through manufacturing to marketing. And the maintenance of these specific departments as you move from one division to the other is not a child's play. So that is why we say it can be costly. It can also lead to duplication of functional activities because as you move from one division to the other, you have, you'll be having the same departments being set up. And it also requires skills management force to be able to manage their respective divisions because there are functional specializations and uh, the, the, the structure is made to mimic uh, or um, to enhance the pursuit of the ultimate agenda of the various divisions. And it also re requires elaborate control system because you may be having several product lines of business you need to Manage and if you do not have a sophisticated control system available, your focus and attention may be on controlling one business unit at the expense of the other. And so there is a need to have a elaborate control system. Then competition among divisions can also become so intense, particularly leading to a lot of dysfunctional uh, actions of the divisions. And this is so because when a particular division is flourishing, and for that matter, it is getting all the needed attention and resources. The competing divisions of the organization that are struggling may 
not find it suitable at all. And they, that may inform them to indulge in some dysfunctional or counterproductive behaviors. And it may also lead to limited sharing of ideas and resources, particularly when the environment is very much competitive. And finally, some regions, products, and customers may receive special treatments, particularly when they are labeled by the organization as the stars or the cash cows of the establishment. So if the organization realizes that by pumping in a lot of revenue, they are able to realize a lot of uh, returns and they are also able to operate in a more viable industry, then definitely a lot of attention will be paid to such industry at the expense of others. And that will mean that um, those, that's, those business units that are characterized as stars and cash cars are going to receive preferential treatment. Then the third strategy available to the implementation, sorry, the third structure available to the implementation of uh, strategy is what we call the strategic business units. And that is also relevant or utilize as the number, size, and diversity of divisions in an organization increase. So when the size, number, and diversity of an organization increases, controlling and evaluating the various divisions become increasingly difficult for the strategists and the managers that manage them. For that reason, it will become relevant for you to create a strategic business unit that will be responsible for managing the complexities that comes forth with the increasing size, number, and diversity of the division. So what happens is that there is the need to group similar divisions into a strategic business unit, and then you delegate the authority and responsibility for each of these units to a senior executive who will now be reporting directly to the CEO or the president of the firm. And that can bring that can help bring a better perception of what is happening across all the divisions. And when this information is communicated to the president or the CEO, then they can take uh, relevant or informed decisions on them. Then the fourth structure is what we call the matrix or the matrix structure. And the matrix structure is further complicated than the functional structure as well as the divisional and the, uh, the business unit strategy. The business unit structure. So when we say the matrix structure, it is simply a combination of the functional structure and the divisional structure so that simultaneously an employee in such an organization may be reporting vertically to one superior and horizontally to another superior. So entry structure is said to be very much complex to run in the sense that it breaks down the rules surrounding chain of command. So as I indicated, uh, from, the, from the bureaucratic point of view of Max Weber, at any point in time, individuals are expected to be reporting to one superior in the organization so that um, that superior can hold the subordinate accountable for whether they are excelling or they are not performing well. But the matrix structure breaks this rule in the sense that it allows for an individual to report to more than one superior at a goal. So um, let me take my time to explain what I mean by this. 
matrix structure or the matrix approach combines aspects of both the functional structure and the divisional structure simultaneously in the same organization. And it is a structure or a tool that evolved as a way to improve the horizontal coordination and information sharing, which was challenging in the, the divisional structure. So, as I indicated, it has a unique feature or character wherein it incorporates the opportunity for individuals to report to um, more than one authority. So we say it breaks the dual line of authority directive that comes with the, um, the vertical functional structure. And now I said the bureaucratic, bureaucratic structure associated with the functional structure. So the, the functional structure hierarchy of authority will run vertically. So when I say vertically, I'm referring to here, either from top to down or down to up. That will be the the vertical, the, the, the functional hierarchy of authority running vertically. But it can also run horizontally. Horizontally means that the person at the middle here will also be horizontally reporting, reporting to the product manager in uh, this particular division, okay? So we have product manager A, product manager B, and product manager C, which means that the company is pursuing a service or a product that can be handled by multiple divisions, including division A, B, and C. And when you get to these divisions, horizontally, they are headed by product managers. So whenever the person in the middle here gets to report to the vice president engineering applications vertically, but also reports to the product manager A here, then we say that the person is reporting to two authorities. And that breaks the uh, unbreakable chain of command clause that has been submitted that at any point in time, every employee is supposed to be reporting to only one superior. Then, um, so for the for the matrix structure, it is possible for an employee to have two authorities or two supervisors to report to at any point in time because horizontally they will be reporting to one supervisor and vertically they will also be reporting to another supervisor. And as I indicated earlier on, this particular structure is a way of reducing the challenges that is obscured whenever we try to implement the divisional structure. So the matrix structure will allow you, uh -huh. so let's use the automobile industry as an example. You realize Ghana, we have automobile companies such as Toyota, Mercedes, and uh, Nissan. And their subsidiaries in Ghana is essentially to assemble the parts of the car and eventually sell it into the Ghanaian market. But these parts are produced from several parts of the world. So if you take Toyota, for instance, they produce the parts from Japan. So a typical operations manager in Ghana may be reporting directly to the CEO in Ghana vertically here, but horizontally to the operations manager 
in Japan. So that person will end up reporting to two authorities, one horizontally and one vertically, all <laughs> with the view of ensuring that the output, which may be the pass in Japan, becomes the inputs in Ghana, which will then be put, into, be put together to assemble and get the car produced. So that will be a typical example of a matrix structure for an automobile company. And these are the advantages and disadvantages associated with the matrix structure. When you go, you can take a super look at them. And this is also another illustration of a matrix structure. So look at this when you go. Now, when we are implementing a strategy, it may sometimes require that the available structure of the organization is re-engineered or restructured so that it will match the intended strategy that we are going to implement. As I indicated in my initial commentaries, it is appropriate to match strategy with structure of the organization so that the allocation of resources to priority areas can be achieved with little or no difficulty. So what do we mean when we say uh, you are embarking on restructuring of an organization? It simply involves the degree to which the organizational structure is reduced in terms of the size for the firm to have a sizable number of employees divisions or units, or sometimes some of the layers will be taken off, and that is what we call the layering. And we do all these things in order to reduce costs. When you are pursuing, for instance, an innovative strategy, an innovative strategy will mean that you are likely to utilize a technology, and that will alter, render a number of your workforce redundant. So all these individuals that are going to be redundant, you will have to take them out of the system in order for the structure to be more efficient for uh, the revenue that will be generated as compared to the cost that will be incurred in generating the revenue. What also is re-engineering of the structure. So re-engineering involves reconfiguring or redesigning the works, duties, jobs, and uh, processes of an organization for the purpose of improving costs, quality, services, and speed. So if you are interested in reducing costs, but at the same time, maintaining the quality and alacrity with which goods and services are produced, then you will have to go in for the re-engineering, which means that you are not only going to be interested with the various layers and the, um, the various units that are going to be found in it, but you are also going to be interested in assuring there is a best fit between the quality of human and non-human resources that are therein and how these are also positioned, particularly how these resources are placed in order to enhance the flow of um, organizational activities. So when we do that, then we are talking about re-engineering. Now, it is obvious that strategy, when it is forged and ripe for implementation, there is the likelihood that the members of the organization that are traditional or used to the old means of achieving organizational long-term aspirations will resist it. For that reason, it is important for one to be equipped 
towards possible strategy resistance or towards any resistance to the implementation of any strategy. So some of the means that can be utilized to manage resistance to strategy includes forcing the uh, forcing change strategy, educating change strategy, and self-interest strategy. So when we say we are using a force change strategy as a way to manage resistance to change, what that means is that um, management are going to give orders and enforce those orders to ensure that the change that they intend to achieve is implemented. So they are not going to offer any room for any uh, any imbecilities. So that means they are not going to entertain any any counter suggestions that are going to be introduced. And when is it more viable to use the force change strategy? Force change strategy is more viable uh, to use when you want to take a quicker decision. Oh, so one of the main advantages of using force change strategy is that it allows for quick implementation of the strategy. And that is where you are not going to entertain any different opinions. So when you require quick action or you require quick implementation without providing room for uh, negotiation of the change that is going to be introduced, then you will go for the first change strategy. But the challenge or the, the, the disadvantage of the use of this first change strategy is that it can lead to high levels of resistance. So the traditional members that may not want the implementation of the strategy to be done because they are used to the old ways of doing things. When they occupy powerful positions, then it can also intensify their level of resistance to the change. So they can um, frustrate the implementation activities and that will not utter well for the long-term aspirations of the company. In the same vein, this can also be disadvantageous because it may lead to uh, damage of trust and morale of the individuals that are at the receiving end. And that also suggests that the underlying concerns that is bothering the mind of the individuals that are likely to resist the change have not been addressed and it will always come back to bite you. Now, an example of a situation where a false change strategy can be used is when a company mandates the use of a new software system and also uh, enforces compliance through strict deadlines and monitoring. So that means that whether you like it or yes, you are expected to um, comply with the directive that is coming from management. Failure to to rates may be met with a lot of repercussions. Then the second option is what we call the educative change strategy, which involves presenting information and education to the targeted employees about the need for the change in order for them to understand and buy into the ideas. And it aims to build understanding and support by providing clear and logical reason to appeal to the conscience and gumption of the targeted employees. Now, when can this educative change strategy be used? It is characterized by research to be more effective 
when the resistance to the implementation of a given strategy stems from lack of understanding or misinformation. So when you realize that there is a lot of misinformation, grapevine or rumors in the system that the moment a particular strategy is implemented, it is likely to result in people losing their jobs or it is likely to people losing their power or authority. Then you can quickly utilize this educative change strategy to um, do the Sergio Ramos job. Uh -huh. So you clear all the confusions and clarify all the misunderstanding that is in the system. And that will help them buy into the strategy that is going to be implemented. So it tends to be more advantageous because it helps to achieve buy-in and support from the uh, remain, remaining members of the organization. And it also helps to reduce uncertainties and fear that may be mongering around like, within the organization. And that also encourages high level of participation and cooperation from the members of the employee because you are able to appeal to their conscience through education. But the challenge is that it is time consuming because you will have to hold a series of debates or meetings to convince and educate individuals to clarify their confusions and their concerns about a strategy that is going to be implemented. So that is it. Then the third option that is available as far as resistance to change can be managed during the implementation of a given strategy is the use of the self-interest change strategy. And this self-interest strategy involves an attempt to convince individuals that a given change, which will crop up as a result of the implementation of the strategy, is to the advantage of the employees. So it's more or less like saying you are initiating the change because of the because you have the good intentions and interests of your employees at heart. So when is it particularly suitable to use this self-interest change strategy? That is, you'll be appealing to their conscience that. You are doing it for their own benefit. It is very more effective to use this strategy when individuals are primarily concerned about how the changes will impact their personal interests. So when they believe personally, they are going to be disadvantaged or they are going to be affected by the change. Then you can use this particular strategy to rather convince them that you are doing the implementation because you have the best interest of, the, of, of them at heart. So an advantage is that you are able to address individual concerns directly and you're also able to motivate them by showing them that the change is going to benefit them personally. But the disadvantage is that sometimes these strategies that are going to be implemented will not end up serving the interests of the employees, but you, 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 want, you may want to achieve their compliance and you may want to reduce their resistance because you want them to allow the change to be initiated. So it may end up being seen or perceived as a manipulative and not a transparent way of addressing employees' concerns. All right, now we are going to look at the last theme for the day, which borders on the strategic human resource issues, which needs to be considered when we are dealing with strategy implementation. So when we are uh, going to implement a given strategy, what are the strategic human resource management issues that are very much important to ensure that the implementation of the strategy will be successful. The first one is to link performance and pay to strategy. And what that means is that at the end of the day, 
we have to align employees' performance and compensation with their strategic objectives in order to ensure that employees are motivated to work towards the company's goals. In a simple palace, what this means, as far as the first point is concerned, is that individuals must be paid for striving. First of all, individuals must be paid for their performance and not necessarily for their uh, longevity in the organization. And I say because of the certificates that they have accumulated over time. So one, you have to pay individuals for their performance. And these performance metrics must also be aligned with the strategy that is intended to be attained so that anyone who exhibits excellent performance directed towards the goal of the organization should be empowered. For that reason, the action that can be utilized to align performance and pay to strategy include the development of performance metrics that reflect the strategy goals. And it also includes the implementation of this, what we call performance, performance based pay and bonus system. So that anytime, um, anytime, an excellent performance is demonstrated, then that performance will now be accompanied by the pay system that will also incentivize high performance work system. Then there's also the need for a regular performance review to be conducted such that when performance of employees is de deviating from their strategic objectives, then we can recalibrate their pay to incentivize them to, to initiate productive work behaviors. Then the second strategic HR issue that is relevant to the implementation of a formulated strategy is balancing work life and home life. When we talk about work life balance, and I say balancing work life and home life, essentially we are looking for, we are looking at the degree to which individuals that are working assiduously in an organization can balance their professional life and their family life, or if you like, their life outside the work environment. So, to what extent can the organization put in place? HR policies and practices that can allow employees to seamlessly juggle between their work responsibilities, family responsibilities, and other personal life activities. The action that can be utilized as far as the attainment of work-life balance is concerned is, to, uh, is for the HR manager to implement what we call flexible work hour options um, telecommuting, which borders on remote working options. And they may also provide uh, resources that can help the attainment of work life balance, such as childcare support systems and wellness programs. So, some organizations have attached to their uh, organizational premises um, a cafeteria where individuals can go there to have their lunch instead of traveling to a distance place to have your lunch. Some even have sports facilities within the organizational premises. Others also have daycare setups, the daycare support system setup for individuals that may be having young offsprings to be utilizing them. So once we are able to channel some of these HR practices in order to seamlessly allow the employees juggle their work and family responsibilities, then we can say that we are allowing the employees to balance their work with their home life. 
The fourth one is also to develop a diverse workforce. So a diverse workforce simply borders on the degree to which the general workplace will be composed of individuals that vary as far as the uh, spectrum of diversity is concerned, ranging from um, age, ethnicity, religiosity, sexual orientation, um, disability, and all that. So what this means is that because there is a lot of benefits for an organization to accrue when they create a diverse workforce, the action that can be initiated from the HR department, particularly to implement, to facilitate the implementation of this diverse workforce, borders on, first of all, implementing a diversity and inclusion training programs, which will empower the general workforce to be very much accommodative and embracive of diversive perspectives. So the fact that uh, a view has been expressed by an individual of a different ethnicity or religiosity does not mean that you have to come across as ethnocentric towards them. Now, beyond, beyond the implementation of a diversified and inclusive training programs, it is also important for the HR practices that border on recruitment and selection, training and development, and promotion to promote diversity. So recruitment and selection should be open to all the diverse all the diversity available in the labor, labor force spectrum. Then when it comes to promotion too, it should not be relegated to any single religious sect or ethnic background, but it should be made, the promotion should be made on merits. And it is only at this point that uh, we can say that we are deliberately providing opportunity for the development of a diverse workforce, irrespective of their diversified background. Then the fourth one is to utilize a portion in hiring a rival employee. When we say a rival employee, a rival's employee, it means that um, when you are given opportunity for a new recruit to be made from your competing organization. Now, hiring from competitors can bring valuable insights, particularly if these fresh blood you are bringing into your organization possess distinctive competencies or capabilities. But there are also risk and legal issues or sometimes cultural clashes that you may confront. Legally, they may be living with, they may be living their, their, their competing organization with some knowledge that is proprietary or a knowledge that's they may not have the right to share with the new organization that they are joining. And for that matter, one action that can be utilized to clarify whether this employee you are hiring from a rival company is not coming with any risk is that you can do what we call background checks to, as a way of doing due diligence and clarifying that whatever information or knowledge that they will be sharing with your new company does not bother on propriety. Then the next one also borders on the creation of a strategy support culture, which means that hello, the implementation, sir. yeah, hello. Uh, so please, some of, some of us have class at one. That's what I was. Oh, really? Is that is it time? 
Okay, we'll 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 1. Oh, then let me wrap up. I'll finish soon, okay? Okay. Thank see. you very much for drawing my attention. So when we say create a supportive culture, it simply means that having, having the strategy available is necessary, but not sufficient for you to achieve a successful implementation outcome. So you have to deliberately create a culture that will provide, provide the support system and also provide the cushion for challenges that may be cropping up to be resolved. Then the next one is that you have to create, you have to be, you, you, you have to be using caution whenever uh, you are monitoring employees' social media. So in this day and age, some organizations are very much particular about the commentaries that their general workforce pass on the social media. But it borders on ethics here because when you monitor your employees as far as their commentaries on the social media is concerned, it means you are invading on their privacy. But on another wavelength, organizations are concerned because when you go out there with the image of the organization to pass derogatory and unhealthy comments on the social media, it will come back to bite the organization. And that is why they are also being admonished that despite the fact that they may have the, they may have the rights to monitor and censure the commentaries that are being made by their workforce, they also have to be cautious in order not to invade into the privacy of the employees. So that is, it is because of that reason why sometimes when you are going for an interview, they will ask for your Facebook handles or your social media handles. They just want to do your a, a, a thorough check of some of your background, uh, sorry, your commentaries on the social media platform. And those social media receipts can give them an appreciation of your personality or who you are beyond the presentation that you are bringing to them during the interview sessions. And the last one is that you need to develop corporate, develop a corporate wellness program. And this corporate wellness program is that you have to have the well-being of the employees at heart. And that is what we mean by a healthy general workforce is an indication of a healthy organization. So that means you must have a, a system that will take care of their health needs, a system that will grant them an opportunity to regularly exercise. Keep fit exercise for the employees. And I say you can register them at a gym for them to periodically be embarking on exercises. In the same vein, you can also make sure that you make health screening a mandatory activity so that the, the health status of all employees is known, not only to the employees, but the company as well. So that will be the end of today's class.